Okay, good morning um, everyone and thank you so much for joining us um, for the CREMS webinar series and today is actually the last in our webinar series um, for 2016 and the focus of the session today is going to be on behavioural activation therapy for depression um, among substance users. So we're really excited to have um, two fantastic presenters to talk um, to us on that topic today. Um, so my name is Lexine Stepinski and I'm going to be chairing the session and what I'd really encourage you to do is if you do have any comments or any questions as as we're going through to, um, to shoot them through on the control panel. So you'll see that there's a little questions box where you can type in any questions that you have and if you can shoot them through as we're going through the session that would be great and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end where um, the presenters will be able to take those questions. Um, so as I said, this is the last um, in our series of webinars um, for this year, but what you can see is that we've had a number of really interesting topics um, over this year and all of those webinars, if you did miss them, are all available um, on demand at our website. So you can just go to comorbidity um, training webinars and you can access the video and the handout for those other webinars earlier in the year. Okay, and just next slide. Um, so what I just wanted to tell you about now is the program for next year. So we've already got a number of um, uh, really interesting topics lined up. So Professor Marie Thiessen in February is going to talk to us about mental health and substance use and a big picture view on the, the issues and the solutions. Um, in March we're going to have um, Associate Professor Francis K. Lampkin talking about effective models of care for comorbid um, mental illness and substance use. And then in April, wow it's a big first part of the year, so already in April um, we've also got um, Chris Morrell, Kath Mills and Jack Wilson will be talking about the National Comorbidity Guidelines. So the best way to stay up to date with what's coming um, is to join our mailing list which you can do so from the website and then you'll be updated about all those upcoming webinars but you can also register for those three um, right now. And next slide, thank you. Um, so I'll just, in a moment I'm going to introduce the speakers, but just very quickly for those that are joining us for the first time, just to give you um, a very quick overview of who we are at CREMS and what we do. Um, so CREMS stands for the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use, and what we're all about is conducting research to improve our understanding of mental health and substance use disorders, and in particular um, how and why these problems co-occur. And we're really um, always working on strategies to improve um, responses to these problems and responses to comorbid disorders, um, which is very much linked to the topic we're, we're presenting on today. And so to achieve these aims, we're working closely with services, with schools and community groups. And this webinar series is one of the ways that we um, continue that dialogue. So we'd love to hear any comments or thoughts that you have um, during or after the session. And just to show you very quickly a little picture of the team, so as you can see there in very bright pink we've got Marie Thiessen, Professor Marie Thiessen, the director of the centre, you can't miss her. <laughs> and so without um, any more delay, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers um, for today. So we're very lucky to have two speakers, um, which is the first time we've had two speakers, so it's excellent to have um, that input. So. Dr. and they're both called Joe. That's the extra special thing about today. <laughs> so, Dr. Joanne Ross, I'll introduce um, you to first of all. So, she's a senior lecturer at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and she has over 20 years' experience in drug and alcohol research. Um, and her research interests include oh, she's also a clinical psychologist. And her research interests include treatment outcomes for substance use disorder and developing clinical interventions for the treatment of psychiatric comorbidity. Um, and Joe Kassa is also a clinical psychologist with many um, with experience in many areas of psychology. In, con in conjunction with her clinical work, um, she is also a research clinical psychologist, and she spent spent seven years working at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre before joining the team at the Fatigue Clinic at UNSW. And her most recent work um, at NDARC was in providing therapy for people with um, comorbid substance and mood disorders. So I'll hand over now um, to Joe Ross, first of all, who will begin the presentation on the topic of behavioural activation treatment for depression among substance users. Thank you very much, Joe. 
Thank you, Lexine. Okay, so um, just to begin, I'll just provide a bit of an overview of what we'll be covering today. Uh, we'll start by looking at the prevalence of co-occurring depression and substance use disorder. Um, and our polling question um, for today, Lexine, if you're able to um, set that up now, that would be good. Yeah, um, sure. Um, so we're just taking a quick poll of the audience to begin the session. So we're just asking approximately what proportion of people with substance use disorder in the community do you think would meet criteria for current major depression? So the options we've got for you, 5%, 10%, 20%, 33%, 30 or 50%. So we'll just take some time there for people um, to vote and let us know what you think. And Joe and Joe, unfortunately, you're not allowed to vote because you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll just have to sit and wait quietly while everyone else finishes the poll. Okay. All right. So just looking at the results now, and what we saw is that actually the majority um, of our audience thought that 50% met criteria. So, um, and then the second most popular answer was um, that a third met criteria. So our audience is really seeing a, a strong connection between substance use and depression. Right. Thank you very much, Lexine. Um, so. As I said, we'll, we'll start today by looking at the prevalence of co-occurring depression and substance use disorder. Um, and then we'll look at some of the harms associated with this comorbidity and look at what evidence exists for the effectiveness of CBT and behavioural activation among people with co-occurring depression and substance use disorder. And then we'll look at the um, core components of behavioural activation and talk about some of the treatment barriers. Um, so just to provide some background then, um, according to the National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, almost one in five people with substance use disorder have major depression. So as you can see, that's quite a bit lower than what our audience is suggesting today. And um, it, given that I'm pretty sure that we have quite a few treatment providers um, listening in today, it, w it probably wouldn't surprise you that among clients in uh, treatment for substance use disorder, the prevalence of depression is even higher, with rates of current depression typically ranging from 20 to 50 percent. And this um, is in stark contrast to the general population prevalence of 4 percent. So um, in, in, a, in a sense, um, the responses we got from the poll are, are accurate for treatment, but not so much for community. So why is comorbidity, this comorbidity cause for concern? The research has shown that comorbid depression and substance use disorder has been associated with a more severe and chronic illness course, an increased risk of relapse in depression and substance use problems, poorer mental health, um, higher risk of suicidal behaviour, greater severity of drug use and a greater social and occupational impairment. So clearly there's need for effective interventions for this form of comorbidity. So in treating comorbid depression and substance use disorder, it doesn't matter which disorder is primary. Um, some people would suggest it's necessary to determine which of the two disorders came first in order um, to look because of the, it's thought to impact on the course of these conditions and they believe it's relevant to treatment planning. And the primary disorder is often based on etiology, so determining which disorder came, uh, came first. Others would argue that the primary-secondary distinction is irrelevant once depression and substance use disorder have surfaced. We know that at least for alcohol use problems in depression, the primary-secondary distinction is not predictive of treatment outcomes. Um, so uh, it's also important to consider that the relationship between drug and alcohol use and depression may even change over time. Um, the relationship is likely to be bidirectional and over time each disorder can work to exacerbate and, and maintain the other. So it can be also difficult to determine from the outset which clients have a depression that will persist beyond abstinence from substances. So treatment really shouldn't be based on primary secondary models and recent, recently researchers have suggested that it's better to focus on 
um, the distress and symptoms associated with depression and co coexisting um, substance use problems. If you um, look at the methamphetamine treatment evaluation study conducted by McKeaton and colleagues um, a few years ago, uh, they actually looked at um, the prevalence of substance-induced depression and found that the symptoms among people experiencing um, depression were just as high as the, the symptoms, just as severe as the symptoms experienced by people with non-substance-induced depression and they had high levels of suicidality and distress. So clearly these are things that need to be um, assessed and monitored in treatment. Um, there has actually been very limited research of psychological treatments for this comorbidity. The most common modality studied has been CBT, but even this is limited. Uh, a review by Hydes in 2010 found limited evidence for the effectiveness of CBT either alone or in combination with antidepressants for the treatment of co-occurring depression and substance use. CBT appears to yield superior results for symptoms of depression and alcohol use um, disorders when compared to no treatment, but there's little evidence demonstrating that CBT is more effective when comp compared to other forms of psychological therapy like relaxation training, MI, um, integrated MI and CBT. The combination of CBT and contingency management has shown stronger evidence than either CBT or contingency management alone in the treatment of this comorbidity. Um, but many of the studies that have been done in this area have had small, fairly small sample sizes and predominantly they've been done with um, predominant alcohol samples. Okay, so some of the challenges in using CBT with substance users also need to be considered. Uh, the complexity of the cognitive techniques can be a problem. Um, due to um, people with chronic, chronic poly drug users who may have low education levels and cognitive deficits, um, they may find the cognitive techniques challenging. Uh, the time consuming of nature of the techniques is also problematic um, because it makes them difficult to incorporate into existing substance use treatments already being implemented. And the, needing, the need for training to be able to implement CBT effectively is um, also needs to be considered and this is training that many alcohol and other drug workers might not have. So these concerns prompted us to look at behavioural activation therapy as an option. So is behavioural activation therapy a, a viable alternative to cognitive behavioural therapy? A study by Jacobson and colleagues back in the 90s uh, conducted a component analysis of cognitive behavioural therapy for depression uh, among 152 depressed outpatients and they compared people receiving just the behavioural component of CBT, people re receiving behav the behavioural component plus modification of dysfunctional automatic thoughts and another group receiving the entire CBT package and they found no difference in recovery rates across conditions. Uh, suggesting that the behavioural components alone may be as efficacious in the treatment of depression as um, CBT. Um, sorry. sorry, I'm just having trouble getting this slide to change. Um, Many of you may be aware of a, a recent study conducted in the UK and published in The Lancet by Richards and colleagues. They conducted an RCT non-inferiority trial which compared behavioural activation to CBT for adults with depression and they recruited the um, patients through primary care and the, the individuals involved in the study had DSM-4 diagnoses of major depressive disorders and what they found was that behavioural activation could be delivered by junior mental health workers with less intensive and less costly training with no less effect than CBT delivered by highly trained professionals. So um, this suggests that BA may um, be a useful option for um, services that have staff with uh, um, less formal training. 
It should also be noted that um, the studies did exclude patients that had alcohol or drug dependent, dependent problems. So um, they obviously not as, the patients involved were not as complex as some of the ones seen in drug and alcohol treatment services. Sorry, for some reason I'm having trouble getting the page to go down. So um, well, what is behavioural activation um, therapy? BA can loosely be defined as a set of strategies that seeks to activate clients in specific ways that will increase rewarding experiences in their lives and improve mood. It involves a range of techniques like monitoring of daily activities, the assessment of pleasure and mastery that's achieved by engaging in a variety of activities. It involves assigning um, tasks of increasing difficulty to engender a sense of pleasure or mastery. Um, it involves discussion of specific problems and the prescription of relevant behavioural activation techniques and uses interventions to ameliorate social skills deficits. So for example, um, assertiveness and communication skills. And BA emphasises in-session efforts to target and disrupt avoidance. Um, in the past 30 years, there have been at least four empirically supported versions of behavioural activation. These include a version by Lewinson, um, a, a version incorporated into cognitive therapy by Beck, and more recent versions by Martel and Lejoie that have led to a renewed interest in behavioural activation in recent years. All four versions share the technique of activity scheduling, a technique designed to increase contact with the um, positive reinforcement in the environment. However, each version elaborates and adds, adds to the basic technique in different ways. Um, today's talk will be based more on recent versions and it's worth noting that Martel tends to put greater emphasis on targeting avoidance and um, avoidance behaviours, whereas Lejoie's approach has greater emphasis on values work. I should also mention that Joe and I have been collaborating on a behavioural activation study uh, of substance users in Sydney with Carl Lejoie and based on a modified version of his bat -DR manual. And we chose this manual because it was, um, it's been used effectively among small samples of substance users in the US. However, today's presentation will also draw on some of Martel's work. So what's the evidence for the effectiveness of BAT-DR, which is the, the, the manual produced by Carl Lejoie? There have been four small randomised control trials of BAT-DR. The first was conducted among depressed psychiatric inpatients um, and found significant reductions in BDI scores over a two week period when compared to supportive counselling and this had an effect size of 0.7 which is pretty impressive. Um, daughters and colleagues then used a modified version of BAT-DR in a residential rehab setting and found significant improvements in depression scores compared to treatment as usual at two weeks post completion. Magdison and colleagues then compared behavioural activation and supportive counselling in an inpatient setting and both groups exhibited significant reductions in depression and the treatment group showed greater increases in behavioural activation and retention in substance abuse treatment. Um, no follow-up data was collected beyond treatment completion, however. Um, the BAT-DR manual seeks to help individuals reduce their depression by increasing awareness of their pattern of depression, the life areas that are most important to them, the values that they have in these life areas and identifying some activities within these areas that make their life feel um, more fulfilling. Okay, um, the five key life areas examined by BAT-DR are relationships, school and career, leisure and interests, mind, body, spirituality and daily responsibilities. Within each of these areas, the individual is encouraged to try and identify what's important to them and what they value or what they value. 
and Jay will be talking uh, in a bit more detail about that later. Activity scheduling is then done in keeping with these values and daily behaviour monitoring is strongly encouraged to help the client get a better understanding of their behaviour patterns and how they relate to depression. And they rate the activities that they do in terms of importance and enjoyment. They're also asked to record an overall score for their mood each day so that they can um, look back on, on their, their activities and link it to their depression or their, their mood. Thanks, Jo. So, Oh, sorry, so okay. yeah, so I guess I, I'll take over from this point for a little yeah. while. So, um, we're now going to look at the core components of behavioural activation. So, I guess fundamental to behavioural activation is functional analysis, which is a technique that's used consistently throughout the treatment. So functional analysis involves gaining detailed understanding of the sequence of antecedent events that lead to the behaviour of interest and then the nature of the behaviour itself and followed by the consequences um, that came after that behaviour. So essentially you're carefully assessing each stage of this sequence and clients can be helped to recognise opportunities for intervening to improve their mood. Uh, it can also just provide the client with some more insight into the ways in which um, their behaviours are triggered and, um, and why they might find some behaviours more difficult than others. And so the use of monitoring forms for recording activities um, are central to this component. So as you can see on the screen, here's just an example of a monitoring form um, that you might want to use. So in order to really effectively conduct and learn from the functional analysis, you need the client to use the form um, to do daily monitoring of their activities. And as you can see on the right hand side, they're recording the enjoyment ratings and also the importance for each activity, as well as each activity at different time points throughout the day. So we also ask them to do their, uh, to rate their overall mood for that day so that this can then be linked back to those activities. Some clients choose to record activities on the sheet regularly throughout the day and whereas others prefer to do it at the end of the day. When you're getting your clients to do this, I would highly recommend that you monitor your own activities for a week so that you can really validate how hard this actually is to do. Um, and it also will help them problem solve obstacles to completing the monitoring sheets. So some planning beforehand might be required, when to do the monitoring, or for example, um, you know, you might be encouraging the client to place the monitoring form on their pillow so that they remember to do it before they go to sleep that night. Um, if the client comes to session without having completed their forms, it's important to complete a couple within the session um, for the past couple of days and this will just give you something to work with but it will also highlight the importance of monitoring. And as treatment progresses, you use these same monitoring forms to collaboratively schedule activities for the upcoming week. Um, and if for some reason the client hasn't completed a scheduled activity, you just ask them to put a line through it so that you know that one wasn't um, completed at that time and then you ask the client to reschedule it to a different time either that day or that week. And if they did complete the activity, you're either getting the client to highlight or circle the activity. And they become, um, the monitoring forms become a nice reflection as well for the client to be able to see what they've actually achieved and how they're progressing through the treatment. So um, identifying values is one of the most important parts of Le Jouet's model. So as you can see in the figure, there are five key, the five key life areas are there in the coloured circles. And then we've created some values just shown in the boxes that connect directly to these life areas. So I guess what we're asking here is what's really important to this particular client. So what does this individual value most in each of these life areas? So that their treatment's really tailored to them and their life areas and um, they're helping to generate these values um, so that it's really tailored to, to them and their circumstances. So for example here we put for school and career, um, examples of values were being educated or financial security. Um, and as you can see, some of the values will connect to multiple life areas. So for mind, body, spirituality um, and leisure slash interests, um, good physical health 
is connected to both of those, indicating that for this client they'd be working in accordance with a single value but in multiple life areas. Sometimes clients struggle with the concept of values um, and they might get them a little bit mixed up with goals. So you may find clients say things like, um, my value is I really want to reconnect with my son. And so that's a really great goal, but um, what you'd be wanting to do is help that client to identify the value underlying that goal. So for example, maybe in this case it's connection or relationship. And uh, the values component of BA can be a little bit challenging for some clients. So especially um, amongst these clients who have a comorbid presentation um, where substance dependence has been an issue, sometimes they can feel as though they've been disconnected from their values for quite some time and it can be difficult and confronting to actually identify what values they have. So I guess one solution that we would use was um, using the magic wand question that you know, people might use in lots of other different types of therapies, but um, asking, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could use it to make life just how you wanted it, what would your life look like? And you're then using the client's description to generate values. So, for example, um, I heard you say that you would be, if, if your life was perfect and just how you wanted it, you'd be a better mother. That sounds like a, you really value your relationship with your daughter, is that correct? And so perhaps that's a value we could place under the relationships life area. So it's important to really normalise the fact that identifying values can be an overwhelming task and to validate the steps that um, the client has already taken towards change and living more in line with their values by attending treatment for their substance use. And so once the values have been generated, you're then looking at generating activities and scheduling those. So um, once the client, I guess, has, has some values in different life areas, so you want to get some breadth to, um, to the work that you're doing. So if you can get the client to really generate at least a few values for each of the life areas, the client can then start to brainstorm and create a list of activities that they can start to work on. So every activity should be connected to a value or to multiple values and life areas. So um, activities all need to be observable, measurable and achievable. Um, and if they're not achievable, they might need to be broken down into smaller steps. So an example of that might be someone who says, um, that they really want to pick up their child from school every day, but in order to do that they need to drive to the school and maybe, so maybe it's observable because you could see them drive to the school, um, it's measurable because they could do that each day and you could count that they did this five times a week, but it may not be achievable if the car's broken down. So the first step might be to organise to have the car repaired. So activities, um, once you've got this kind of big brainstorming session of activities, you're then ranking them in order of perceived difficulty. So you're using them, um, you're then using the monitoring forms to start to schedule in some of the easier tasks for the coming week. And you might want to start with clients with some tasks that they're, or activities that they're actually already doing. So some activities on that list um, will be things that they're, they're doing already, but it also just helps to tie it back into their values and, um, and can create, I guess, some more motivation to be, to be engaging in those healthy behaviours. So, um, BA also utilises contingency management, which is defined as any attempt to arrange contingencies to support out-of-session activation. So it may involve contracting with significant others to interact with the client in ways to increase non-depressed behaviour. So an example might be if the value was um, physical health and the client said they want to go for regular walks but they're struggling to, to get out and do that, you might ask the client to contract with a friend or maybe their sister um, to see if the uh, friend or sister wants to go for a walk on a Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday and um, they'd actually be talking to that person about, look, I'm really trying to increase my walking, um, do you think that you could meet me for a walk and essentially kind of contracting with that person that they're going to assist them to achieve that activity. So um, there is, it can be challenging because obviously not everyone has necessary supports to establish contracts 
um, and therefore you may need to actually uh, work on communication skills first um, before you can actually go into the, the contingency management with contracts. Um, and then alternatively, it's also possible to just introduce a contingency that doesn't naturally occur. So um, you could do, for example, if the activity was to do some grocery shopping, um, then you might uh, encourage the client to also schedule in treating themselves to a coffee afterwards. So you can um, both use self-administered rewards, they can be written down into the contract or you can also just write them into the monitoring forms as well. Um, an important barrier to effective behavioural activation treatment is depressive rumination and rumination involves repeatedly focusing on one's internal state without making plans, problem solving or taking steps to make changes to relieve distress. Um, behavioural activation sees rumination as a problem behaviour that disengages the individual from their environment, thereby reducing participation in the moment and prevents effective problem solving. So rather than, than seeing um, rumination as a thought process to be challenged, it's looked at in a behavioural way. BA focuses on the antecedents and consequences of negative thinking, so it asks questions like, what situations triggered the rumination? What happened before the client was thinking this way? Did it lead to helpful problem solving or did the person feel stuck? Um, in a negative state and what op opportunities were missed while the person was ruminating. By highlighting missed opportunities with the, for the client, um, it's then possible to suggest alternative healthy behaviours. Sorry Jo. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so, um, like for all of us, obviously life events can happen frequently and they can shift our, what it can do I guess in BA is just shift the focus away from the behavioural activation. Um, I guess crises are even more um, pertinent amongst this group because um, for people often recovering from substance dependence, um, there can be some legal or relationship problems that might occur um, during that process and so I guess it's what's really important here is just to allow time to risk assess um, at, in sessions and also just to discuss any pressing issues. So it can be challenging to try to encourage the client to come back to a focus of BA but one thing that we found helpful was to, if a client came in and they, uh, for example, had an upsetting phone call that week with a family member and they were really needing to debrief about that, um, that you'd obviously give them the time to do that and, and validate and, and use sort of just core clinical skills but you would then um, maybe just talk to the client about, look, this sounds so important, um, I I'm, I'm really want to hear about this. I'm also aware that you've put a lot of effort this week into your monitoring and into your scheduled activities, so would it be, do you think it would be okay if we unpack this for maybe 15 minutes and then we, we shift to BA, what, what feels good for you? And obviously using a collaborative approach with your, your, with your client in that situation. Um, and then you may also encounter barriers that are specific to the treatment centre that you're working in. So in patient settings we found um, they obviously have a really good attendance at sessions but clients can sometimes feel restricted in terms of the activities that they're actually able to complete. Um, just due to sometimes the structured nature of the treatment setting that they're in, they may not have a lot of free time or um, the ability to go out to leave the the inpatient setting and go and actually do some of the activities that they're keen to work on. So you just need to be really creative um, and as best you can use the group setting to the client's advantage. So in some ways it may be better to introduce BA a little bit later in the treatment when clients have a bit more freedom. Um, and the main barrier in outpatient services was poor attendance at sessions, so using text reminders the day before can be really helpful um, just to keep the client on track. So in summary, um, behavioural activation seeks to activate clients in specific ways that will increase rewarding experiences in their lives and improve mood. Activity mon monitoring and functional analysis are key components of this approach. 
Um, and a recent paper by, in The Lancet by Richards and colleagues suggests that behavioural activation can be delivered by staff with no formal training in psychological therapies. Um, and while BA has some promising empirical evidence, there's clearly um, need for larger clinical trials among substance users. Um, but uh, certainly um, in, the, in the meantime, it looks like behavioural activation is something that be, can be taken up by treatment services quite easily um, due to the more simple um, nature of the, the treatment. Um, before we finish, I just wanted to also uh, oh, say that we, oh sorry, <laughs> at the end of the, the presentation that you can download, there's a, a list of resources that you might find helpful. Um, basically, um, the um, treatment manual uh, or clinician's guide that Martel has put out, the um, uh, book on um, behavioural activation by Cantor, um, Carl Jouet's manual is available for download as well. Um, and if you're interested in looking at behavioural activation, they're, they're just some good resources to start with. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. I'll just see if I can put up that slide for you. Um, maybe can people see? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thanks. great. Um, thanks so much, Joe. And um, can people see the slide now? Can you see the slide now, Joe? The resources yes. slide. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. I know um, I've suddenly got so many questions um, flowing from that really, really useful content that you've presented, and um, I'm sure the audience probably has questions too. So I'd encourage everyone, if you do have questions, to we've got a few come through already, but if you do have questions, um, please to to shoot them through. Um, and so the first question um, that we do have, I think, is answered probably by your resource page, Joe, <laughs> because um, uh -huh. someone's asked whether um, the BATDR manual is available publicly. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. that you've, you've got that reference there. It's the clinical yes. psychologist that you've got up. Uh, the two Lejoy papers um, are, are both covering the manual. There was the manual first got produced in 2001, and then they uh, revised it in 2011. Um, mm. So the both references are there. Fantastic. And so, the, yep. So the manual is accessible to people. Um, yes. Just on that, I should yeah. also mention that a paper by Joe and I, in, in collaboration with um, Carl, also talks about some of the the finer points of delivering the intervention. When we did the training with Carl Lishway, there were things that came out in the training that we wouldn't have picked up on mm. from the, um, the treatment manual. So that's maybe worth a look as well. Okay, mm. fantastic. Um, okay, great. And um, so a couple of, um, of thoughts initially and um, while we get the audience questions through, I really loved your suggestion, Joe Kaffer, <laughs> of, um, mm -hmm. of therapists doing that monitoring themselves. I mean, it's, it's a simple suggestion, but it really struck a chord with me because I was thinking, yeah, that would be a really good, um, that would be really informative to do it yourself. And I just wondered whether yeah. you had um, had made use at all of any, um, you know, new technology sort of makes, opens up new avenues for monitoring. And I wondered if you found that useful at all with clients. Yeah, it's a good question and we, we start, did start to look into this because I agree it would be really helpful to have an app to, to monitor activities. So unfortunately in the setting that we were, because we were using this treatment in a mm. clinical trial, yeah. in that setting um, no we didn't have um, the ability to use other technologies and some of the treatment settings, so the inpatient settings um, for a lot of the clients, so a lot of the um, treatment settings we were at, they actually didn't have access to their phones mm, yep. um, throughout the day, which was a barrier to being able to obviously use apps and things. Yeah. But certainly in my private clinical work, um, if I were to do this, I would be encouraging a client to use um, whatever was easiest for them to monitor. So whether that's the calendar um, on their phone or whether um, we actually just look for an activity scheduling, um, like general activity scheduling app. Um, I know there's many different sort of CBT based apps out there yeah. and yes you could absolutely use those but but you're right it's really helpful to do it yourself because it did mm -hmm. highlight how 
how <laughs> um, how tricky it was at times to be motivated to to actually yeah. fill that in at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. For sure. Okay, and um, and so the 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 treatment here is obviously really focusing on um, on the behavioural components um, of treatment. But I just wondered whether is there any um, any reason why you wouldn't use this in conjunction with also some cognitive strategies, thought challenging things like that as well. Um, I suppose initially uh, it depends on the, the clients that you're dealing with. Um, when I was talking about some of the limitations of using CBT with substance users, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're working with a client that you feel might struggle with cognitive um, type approaches, then obviously it wouldn't be appropriate. Also it depends on how the rationale for the um, treatment has been presented. Uh, I know Cantor has suggested that mix using um, monitoring when you're also do, doing behavioural therapy can sometimes um, make the rationale a bit harder for the client to follow. But personally I think if anything that you think works for your client, if, if you think it's appropriate um, for your client, I, I wouldn't see that there'd be a problem with it. And would you agree, Jo, that it's... Yeah, yeah I would agree. And I think... I th I think what was really useful about um, not having the cognitive component um, for some of for some of our clients was that, as Joe mentioned earlier in the talk, that it can be um, you know there can be some cognitive deficits from from using sub from polysubstance use for such a long time. Um, but obviously, for a lot of these clients, they would be easily able to engage in cognitive work. So I think that yeah, it's, it would come down to that clinical judgment on yeah. Okay, and it was interesting when you when you put up those slides about um, rumination, Joe, which was really helpful, and you know, just talking through and unpacking the rumination process. It occurred to me that a lot of what you were doing was really um, <laughs> challenging, kind of some meta beliefs about rumination in a way. You know, looking at how helpful <laughs> it was and looking at the consequences of rumination. So I'm sure you're ultimately getting at the cognitive work, um, but just via the behavioural pathway. So I guess that's what you're saying, to, in keeping it yes. simple for these clients or keeping a, a clear focus initially? Yes, yeah, I agree with you completely. Um, uh, and and I think sometimes too when people are really depressed, it's, it's easier to push yourself to do something behaviourally than mm. to think through mm. thought challenging processes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well on that question of the behavioural activities, we've got a question um, through. So just asking you to talk a little bit more about generating activities and to what extent do you rely on clients to generate themselves um, versus suggesting activities um, that might be helpful, might improve mood? That's a great question. I think that's probably one that I would have asked in the training with Carl, actually. <laughs> um, so, yeah, look, it really is so dependent on the client. So, obviously, some clients can just really engage with this stuff very easily. It, I do think it's pretty easy to engage with, especially when you're continually drawing back to values. But I think um, initially, sometimes clients will struggle a little bit with generating activities that are observable, measurable and achievable. So sometimes um, activities that someone might suggest something and it's like, oh, that's not just, that's just a little bit further down the track. And so I guess where I might step in at that point with the client would be trying to then encourage them to break that activity down. So if um, if they said something like, I want to get a job and that's the activity, well, we can't, obviously you can't schedule that in, but you'd be really breaking down um, into achievable activities, what that might look like. And that might start with, I need to just find a template of a CV online. Mm -hmm. So. I would be assisting, I probably would be assisting quite a bit for somebody who was struggling um, mm -hmm. to generate activities and I would try to put examples out there um, and try to give them a bit of a menu of activities that but that were really specific to their values. So, um, so I'd really be trying to generate that on the spot and be creative with the client um, and obviously engaging the client as much as possible. So checking in with them, do you think that that does sound like that's in line with your value? Um, and if they said, well, nah, not really, that's not really what I mean, that, 
that's a really good opportunity to then, I guess, dig a little bit deeper into that. So what do you mean by that value and, and what would feel, you know, what would sit better for you? And yeah, so I guess um, it's hard to say, obviously it just depends on the client, but um, certainly some clients I would have to do a lot more mm. generation of activities um, and others would just run with it and, you know, needed minimal input from me. Yeah. So... And on that, um, you made a, a real point about distinguishing between goals and values, so helping clients to then kind of work back from their goals to identify those broader values. I just wondered if you wanted to mention um, why do you think that that is in, important to do so? I mean, is that because it's giving you broader scope or, you know, what's your reason for really emphasising those values beyond the goals? I think that it's, yeah, it's partly that, it's partly the broader scope and I think it's also partly about really connecting the client with the reason why they're doing an activity. Mm. So that it's actually about their core, it's about a value, it's about the way I want to live my life. So I want to live my life in line with a set of values that are individual to me and, you know, I, I guess what we're wanting is for the client to feel ownership over those activities. Um, because they're connected to their values. So it's not just something that the therapist told me to do, it's something that I'm doing because I really strongly um, feel that connection is important to me. Mm. So does that sort of... Yeah, sense? yeah, yeah, does that, it yeah. does. Anything to yeah. add on that, Joey? Ross? <laughs> yeah, I, I just... <laughs> I should call us J1 and J2. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just going to add that sometimes when trying to get clients to do the more mundane activities as well, to have it linked back to values yes. can make those tasks, in a funny sense, more enjoyable. So like, you know, yeah. putting on a load of washing, when you can reflect on the fact that it's actually in line with your values about looking after your family and, yeah. and being a, a good mother, yeah. it, it suddenly doesn't seem it's such an onerous task. Yeah. That's a fantastic point and I think um, it links really well to our next question because I guess you're in some ways you're connecting to motivation there as well, aren't you, by bringing in those mm. those broader values. And so we've got um, a bit of a, a, a challenging question here. Well, I guess someone reflecting on the challenging experiences in DNA um, services mm. potentially. So do you have any suggestions um, for when you've got clients attending due to legal obligation um, that don't have met much motivation for change? Um, is there something that we could use BA for in those cases? So obviously motivational interviewing is something um, that this person is saying that they've, um, they've tended to be using in those cases, but is that, do you see a role for BA in those kind of cases as well? Um, most, most definitely. I, I think that's one of the beauties, I think, of BA is it's, it's almost, to me, it feels transdiagnostic in that... Um, I can't think of anyone that wouldn't actually benefit from, from doing behavioural activation because it is kind of linking into key values and getting you busy doing things that are important to you. Um, so perhaps someone in the situation of that client might not have reflected on their values for a while and might have actually lost touch a little bit with what's important to them. Um, so it can be a useful technique for improving motivation in that way. But it also sits really neatly with motivational interviewing, I think. What, what do you think, Jo? Yeah, I agree. I think, I think that um, the, the therapist asking that question uh, makes a really good point that um, motivational interviewing is probably an important component early on if you're working with a client in that type of a situation. Um, if I'm really honest, I think I think I had the same question again back in training and felt like, and a lot of, um, our, not a lot, but well, yeah, but I guess a lot of clients I've worked with have been in that exact situation where essentially they're attending treatment because it's been court mandated. And I actually found BA to be pretty easy to engage clients with. Um, and you'd sort of be looking at, well, you know, if you've got to be here, we might as well do something and you might as well be doing stuff between sessions that at least make you feel good and so it actually was a pretty, it's a pretty easy one I felt to tie in, um, mm. yeah, to MI techniques and also I guess just to, to tie in for the client um, around I guess helping them to make some behavioural changes 
the other thing is too, I guess, for a client who maybe hasn't completely bought in yet around their substance use potentially. Um, so maybe they haven't fully bought in that they need to, mm. you know, that for them they might, you know, require a period of abstinence or whatever. Um, you can actually still help them look at, okay, well, what are some life areas here that feel a bit less threatening than that? So let's look at some, maybe it's just organisation, maybe that would be helpful. And mm. so daily responsibilities, that type of life area. Does that, Joe? do you, Joe Ross, do you agree? Yeah, that completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think because it because of the range of life areas you're looking at, mm. um, it mm. it um, isn't just focused in on their substance use either. It can um, so if if they're resenting having to be there talking about substance use and mm. and um, um, being in treatment, I, f I feel like BA is kind of broader than that. If mm. you like, yeah. Okay, well that ties in nicely to our next question. Um, uh, another really good question, I think. Um, do you so alongside the the BA work and the BA um, goals? Do you are you working in substance reduction goals as well, along with those goals? If that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yes. So <laughs> essentially, <laughs> um, yes. The answer would be yes. So you're looking at activities that are, um, so partly you might look at, okay, where is, when are you using substances in the day? So for someone, I'm thinking more of an outpatient client in this situation um, where they may still be using substances regularly and so you'd be sort of looking at their monitoring and going okay well at what points of the day were you triggered and were cravings um, more intense and so you might do some coping with cravings type of work but then also looking at okay let's replace that um, behaviour, that unhelpful behaviour with a more um, healthy behaviour from your activity list. Mm. So you'd be helping to kind of identify again using that functional analysis to really work out where do we need to make some change in this in the day for this particular client um, and also some of the activities that you're generating with clients are often around substance use reduction. So it might be things like um, you're scheduling in seeing my drug and alcohol um, caseworker or um, going to NA meetings, um, attending my GP appointment, those kinds of things, you would actively be putting in those monitoring sheets um, that are you know, around reducing substance use. Mm, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, I've got one more question for you and then we'll, um, <laughs> we'll let you get on with your day. Um, but thank you for, for being so helpful. It's been a really great discussion. Um, so the last question for today, um, a follow-up actually from um, the earlier question about um, clients who um, might be um, legally obliged to attend therapy. Do you have any tips about how we might monitor progress um, with BA if they're they're not able to comply or they're failing to comply with um, activity monitoring? Uh, um, so I guess it would be about when they attend the session, at the start of the session, if they haven't monitored, which obviously happens, you know, it can happen frequently for some clients. It really was about focusing in on, okay, well, we need to do that now. So mm -hmm. you'd work through the last few days yeah. um, to try to get them to be able to reflect back. Obviously that's much harder to do than if you're just doing it regularly and sometimes that would actually help clients for the following week because they'd find it, yeah, it was harder to do it yeah, yeah. in session so it's yeah. easier if I just do it as I go. Um, or you might just shift the goalpost a little for some clients initially if they're really, really struggling to complete any monitoring forms. I would say if you could do two this week, mm. could you do one on Sunday and one on Wednesday um, and let's start there and then we'll try to build them up to doing some more monitoring. Um, does that does that sort of answer that? Was yeah, that about yeah. yes. with the BA? Yeah, stuff? yeah, fantastic. And we've got a reply online saying yes, thank you. That helped answer the, the question. <laughs> so fantastic. So thank you so much to both of you. Um, so I guess it, it's sounding like this is a really useful tool um, for people working in services that they can, um, you know, pick up fairly easily and run with, which is fantastic. So what would you recommend if someone's wanting to start out with this? So you've got your, your useful resources list. 
what would you recommend as kind of the first go-to text um, if someone wanted to start applying this? It's, it's really hard to be too directive, I think, in that um, the approaches are, are quite different. Uh, so okay. the, the approach put forward by Martel and the approach put forward by Lejoie, I, I think you'd need to look at both and work out what suits you best, whether yeah. it's better to, um, like if you like the values work, I think then going with Lejoie is a better option. Um, not that the others don't look at values as well, it, they just don't have as much focus on it. Um, Okay, so having basically, said, having, yep. ha having said that, when we started working on the, the trial, we um, were following um, Le Jouet's manual, but it's still really useful to read the other um, resources as well, just to, you know, get things expressed in a different way. Yep, yep. Okay, so basically those last two texts, it sounds like, on the list um, are going to be a great starting point for, for people out there. Yeah. Excellent. I think so. Yeah. Would, <laughs> would you agree, Jo? Is... Yes, I agree. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. So we will be making the handouts um, available for everyone um, online. So you get an email um, giving you details about how to access that. Also the video of the session. Um, so if any colleagues have missed it, um, please feel free to, um, to just let them know um, and pass on the, the video details for them. And um, Thank you so much, Joe and Joe. Um, so, and just um, to finalise, just to let you know that we do have another um, another three at least um, oh. webinars coming up in 2017. So we would encourage anyone who's interested to register for those and to sign up to our mailing list and visit our website to have a look at the upcoming events um, in the new year. And we're really looking forward to continuing this conversation um, with you then. It's been great to have you with us. Thank you for the really interesting questions. And we hope you have a very good day and a very happy holiday season. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.